All right, thanks, Dave. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about flexing your biceps with Azure. And I'm going to start off with a very rough definition of uh, infrastructure as code. Now, the point of infrastructure as code, or IAC, is uh, to automate the provisioning of your resources in cloud. Uh, usually now, as it's been triggered by the success of CI/CD pipelines becoming very popular, you know, places, you know, that's, these are the tools we use to automate everything we do. Uh, so sort of on the platform side and even on the, the build side, right? So we want to build our software and want to provision our hardware. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to do it by hand. So the CI CD processes along with uh, infrastructure as code uh, is, is you know, a big part of what I do as well every day. Now, why we do this is to help manage our costs, risk, and to increase the speed of delivery for our applications. But the cloud infrastructure, cloud applications, that whole landscape is getting very complicated. This is hundreds or even thousands of different services that we can uh, deploy into the cloud uh, you know, from all the different providers. But for me, I, I see a lot of these sort of just data formats like JSON, YAML, uh, and XML everywhere. You know, this is what a lot of uh, the sort of the go-to choice for people to define their resources uh, uh, and the configurations for those resources as well. But they're just data formats. And then to get them to be a bit more dynamic, a bit more intelligent, We've tried to shoehorn uh, like programming constructs into them, for instance. So we'll look at some of the uh, the classic ARM JSON templates uh, and compare that with uh, the Bicep and other sort of uh, IOC providers out there. Because for me, I, I, as an engineer, I like to keep everything simple. So I want to follow that, uh, keep it simple, and or keep it sweet and short uh, principle. Uh, so you can say that one in different ways, but that's my favorite. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name's William. I'm a lead software engineer at Xenix. Uh, so I spend a lot of time with customers, building new projects for them, but also play a big part in the platform side to make sure that we can uh, migrate customers into Azure that need to or enable them to get into Azure as well. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I have uh, a GitHub repo as well uh, and LinkedIn. So if you want to engage me in any of those, feel free. Also have a blog site called azuregems.io. And uh, a lot of today's talk will also go on there. And uh, you can find me on the mel.net meetup uh, page as well. So, uh, yeah, like I said, big fan of Azure. Pretty much every day I do something Azure related. Uh, and, and .NET. been using .NET since version 2, uh, two since 2005. Oh, I forget the day or the year now. It's a long time ago. But <laughs> I skipped the first version. I think what's this uh, crazy new technology? I was a, a very dedicated C++ uh, fan back then. Uh, but then, you know, .NET 2 came around and changed my life. It changed my career, basically, as well. So I've been doing .NET ever since. Uh, currently, big fan of uh, Blazor WebAssembly, uh, pairing that with some of the serverless uh, offerings like Azure Functions and, and Cosmos DB. So, you know, can definitely write up some really cool applications using those services. But the new favorite is uh, Azure Bicep. So that's the tool that we're going to be looking at today. And just for the agenda, so I'm going to quickly cover what is Azure Bicep, compare that with the other uh, providers out there like Terraform and Pulumi, and then see how do we use Azure Bicep, what we can do with it. And there's a cool new feature out called Bicep Registries, and uh, we'll look at how we can sort of encapsulate our complex architectures using these registries and demos everywhere. So uh, yeah, we're gonna gonna have some fun. Now, first, I have to just explain where ARM comes from. So it's actually the Azure Resource Manager. And we can see that the Azure Portal, PowerShell, the Azure CLI, uh, and even other REST clients, they all either talk directly to the ARM REST API or via one of the uh, SDKs from Azure, so .NET, uh, Python, Go, I think. There's a variety of them now. Can't keep up so many. But you know, it's a way that we interact with the uh, ARM or Azure Resource Manager to go and create the, the resources or the, the services that we require for our applications. So you know, data stores, web apps, VMs, this is a whole, whole stack of them. But what is Azure Bicep? So first, it's literally, we start with a file, it's some code in a file, you know, infrastructure as code. And this time I think we're gonna be dealing with real code rather than sort of a, a weird mishmash of, of data format with some programming sugar added to it. We can start with the Bicep file, and uh, we call it ARM Bicep. 
Because once we actually take this BICEP file and we try to deploy it in the background, when we call the Azure CLI BICEP build, it takes the BICEP file and transpiles it into the existing uh, ARM JSON that we're used to. And I'll, in a moment, we'll see what the sort of differences are with uh, between these two files. Uh, but you know, it, up until recently, we actually had to do this manually. You have to do the build, and then we can deploy the JSON file that was output from that. But the, the tooling has improved a bit, so we can actually deploy the BICEP file directly. So it's sort of like just in time compiled for us. You know, so we don't have to care about turning it into a JSON file. So again, then that file, you know, the BICEP file, we hit the ARM interface. And it will just go and provision whatever sort of resources we need. So you can see there's you know, more than 250 available resources in Azure right now. Uh, and just to recap, there's two types, JSON and BICEP. But they're both called ARM templates. So I guess now we have to be a bit more specific when we talk to someone which one we're actually talking about. But I kind of hope you know, when we say ARM templates, you're just going to mean BICEP ones. You don't want to touch the old JSON one anymore. Because uh, we'll see why, and both of them, yeah. So they they end up translating to calls into the ARM uh, to make these resources that we want appear. And just a further definition of of BICEP. So it's a, it's a domain specific language, a DSL. So it's actually dedicated uh, language to describe the resources that we want. We're not piggybacking off something that already existed, trying to make it do what we want. This is dedicated for creating stuff in Azure. It's way simpler to write something in BICEP than it is compared to JSON. Now, they've added a few extra sort of cool things to it. So you can actually have more modular templates, and we can actually reuse our code a lot easier than we previously could. Um, but it doesn't matter. You know, in the end, it still uh, transpires to the JSON equivalent underneath, uh, but it's actually quite a lot of JSON underneath. You don't really want to be playing around with it. And the stuff that we can do in BICEP, you can definitely do in ARM. You know, that's it's all. Everything has to go through ARM JSON, but they've just made it so much easier. And so this is what a basic, very basic BICEP template would look like. Uh, in this case, I'm just creating a storage account. And just like the ARM JSON files that we're used to, we've got input parameters. You know, so and, just highlight it with the param keyword, give it a, sim a symbolic name, so in this case, storage account name, and we can give it a type. Uh, in this case, it's a string. Then we can go ahead and define our actual resource. And we're gonna look at a few of these uh, during the talk today, but in this case, I'm creating a storage account. Uh, start with the key resource keyword, storage account, and symbolic name. So it's like an object you can reuse, so it's a, or like a variable in, in most of our program programming languages. In fact, it's an object. So we'll see later if you use that dot notation, you can actually drill down into that resource to you know, inspect some of its properties and reuse them. And then we actually specify after that the resource provider type. So these are um, sort of carry over still from the ARM JSON templates. Um, instead of a type, we just give it there, the whole string there with an API version. And uh, But it's really cool. Though, so they've made this a whole lot easier as well with BICEP with the, the tooling provided in VS Code. Um, and we get some really cool IntelliSense as well. Now, another thing that we can do with the BICEP is that once it's run through and provisioned a, a resource for us, we can actually pull some properties out of that resource and uh, send it as an output. And so we can either print that to console or we can actually wire it into another ARM template or BICEP template. Uh, and so it's definitely uh, quite useful to wire up multiple things and create a longer process. So that basic storage account example, uh, it's on the left-hand side. Now the screen's a bit tiny, but just to sort of show that the BICEP on the left, a lot simpler than the ARM JSON on the right-hand side. So when we take the BICEP file, we build it or transpile it, we, uh, we get the, the thing on the right-hand side there. So you can see it's almost half the length uh, in, in this case. And it does vary a little bit from resource to resource and the number of um, properties that they have, et cetera, and all the different constructs that we're using, functions and conditionals, all that. But uh, generally, it saves us a lot of, a lot of keystrokes and a lot of time. I was, yeah, big fan of that. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly jump into uh, a demo. And if that works, 
Well, there we go. Um, now I'm in VS Code, and I've got a folder ready to go and create just a, a storage account. And if I can type correctly, I'm going to call it storage account dot bicep. What you need to do first, obviously, to get going with this, you need to install the bicep language service. And there's a cool little extension here. You just click that one, install that. Current version 4.1008. That's the latest one. And once you have that installed, you can do some really cool things. So if we go and type in the resource, or well, RES for short, we're going to pop up. So we can already get some intelligence here to say, you are trying to create a type of resource. Let me show you the ones that are available. So you can scroll down here and look for all sorts of stuff. You can see there's all the various API flavors of Cosmos DB, Data Lake, Firewalls, Key Vault. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff already there, so some nice snippets. So what I'm looking for right now would be storage. So if I just highlight that one, click Enter, and automatically we've got all this code done for us. It's quite nice. Uh, so what we then can do is give this a symbolic name. I'm just going to keep the one called storage account, but you can obviously change that to whatever unique variable you want. Then uh, we need to give it a name. So I'm just going to call this um, UC Store 21. Uh, we can change the version, and we can see here they automatically got some IntelliSense to show us all the possible values for that the, the, the type of storage account that we want, all the different enumerations here. So I'm going to keep the latest one, V2, and even here we can change the SKU type. But it works now. Oh. Not long ago, the, this one was not available. So they're, they're constantly improving the IntelliSense uh, from a lot of the feedback on GitHub and so forth is when uh, a particular resource uh, property is not available, uh, it means that there might be a, a piece missing from the ARM swagger definition. So the uh, Azure and Bicep team are working quite hard to sort of make sure that all these um, bad definitions or missing definitions uh, get fixed up. So now that's cool. Now we can actually easily see what type of uh, storage account we want to provision. I'm just going to pick this standard one here. And this is already a done by some module that can actually take this one and deploy it. So let's see if that actually works. So I've already got a little PowerShell script here just to go and create a resource group for me. So it's AZ group create, give it a name, give it a location, and then we want to go and deploy this template to our resource group. We make sure we save the, the correct file. So in this case, storage account dot bicep, not JSON. Um, and uh, give some parameters. Oh, I was going to say, oh yeah, let's do, let's add a parameter. We want to have a parameter, we want to have storage account name. So we can actually make this a bit more dynamic. I don't want to hard code strings. Um, and it's a string. We can give it a default value. Uh, we can just call it Fred. Oh, but it complains about something here to say literals. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Strings are defined using single quotes in Bicep, so that's right. So what we also have is a linting tool that's sort of built into the, the Bicep language service. So it tells us when we're doing things wrong. And we can actually configure that as well. We'll show you a little bit later. So strings are all done with single quotes in Bicep. Cool. And we're saying, see here that we're actually not using our storage account name parameter. So I'm just going to take that and put it in here. Uh, don't have a hard-coded name anymore. So I'm just going to copy this, make sure that it is the same in here, storage account name. Yep. All right. So now for the scary bit, let's just go make sure I'm in the right folder, and I'm going to deploy the storage account straight away. There we go. Uh, it's gone and created a resource group for us, and it should now be spinning around in the background to create the storage account as well. So if I go to my Azure portal, refresh, should hopefully see that here, NDC storage, there's the resource group. And if I quickly get to the deployments tab, we can see here our storage account is actually being deployed right now, which is cool. And what we can also do is we can see the inputs that went into this template. So that's the name we gave the storage account. 
there aren't any outputs just yet. Uh, but the template that we're actually that it's running against, we can see here is now the JSON template. That's the uh, the JSON equivalent equivalent of the byte by set file. I'm trying to say that fast five times. Um, so let's see. It, there we go. The resource uh, has been completed. We can go there. Here is our storage account, and we can see it's all it's all working. Great. So here we go, and the CLI finished for us, which is really really awesome. So we have a, a Bison file that deploys a storage account, nice and simple. Uh, happy days. So we can actually see uh, just to show you one more thing. If we look at the storage account, we go Control Space. See, there's other properties, there's identity. So if we hold tab on that, it'll tell us whether it's an object or an array. We go in there, order complete. Here's all the other fields. You know, it's, it's nice and discoverable. It's, it's it's how you want a programming language or a domain specific language to work. So the, the tooling is really great, and we don't really have to go back to the the Microsoft Docs site to. Uh, Often it still happens now and then where something that's missing, like I said earlier, but it's got a lot, a lot nicer. So yeah, we can go there and we can assign. It even tells us if the boolean and give us some auto completion. That's so cool. Okay, I'll leave that there. And um, what I also want to show you. So I've created a resource. I've got parameters, but there's a whole lot more we can do. Like I said, so it's a, a domain specific language. It is like a programming language. So I've got a whole bunch of examples here. I'm going to start from the top and work my way down. So the basics are, that goes into an, a BIOSEP template is parameters. So like I said, uh, showed earlier, we can have uh, a parameter, give it a name, give it a type, and a default value. You can actually have it just like that, no default value. So then it becomes a required parameter. But we can also say these are the allowed values. So you can't give me an input other than these three. So I only want to have Australia East, South East, and West US as my uh, locations where I'm going to deploy this resource. And so if I try and give it one that says uh, East US, it'll say, you can't do that, sorry, denied. So we can then also go further and have real comments in our code now, which is uh, not, you know, it's not a JSON thing. You can't really have J uh, comments in JSON until recently they, they said did make that work. But uh, yeah, now we can actually add comments, make our BIOSIT file sort of be a bit more descriptive and have some good information in there. We can add other decorators. So apart from allowed, there's things like description and max length. So you can actually say what this input parameter is for. You give it a description, the name of the project, and the maximum length, so 32 characters. Or if it's a different type of value, so for uh, numeral types or integers, we can give it a min and max value, which is really cool. And a description. So we can just pile up all these things, and we'll see later on when we reuse another template uh, how useful it is when it shows you uh, these descriptions when you're reusing a template. We can also go a bit further and include secure strings. Now, what this means is uh, you, you still give it an API key or a password or something sensitive. It's just that when your template is being deployed, that value will not be displayed anywhere, it will not be logged. But the trap is if you do assign it to something else that you do want to log or um, you pass into a script that then goes and prints it to the console, then you've exposed that key. So just be wary that it's not going to be a magic solution. You can still do the wrong thing, but it already just helps you for the basics so that uh, you don't want to expose keys or stuff like that by accident. Now, we can also go and define variables using um, functions. So a lot of the ARM functions, well, pretty much all of them, they've all carried over into BICEP. So here, for instance, I'm creating a variable called storage account name, and I'm following a convention. So prefixing it with the name storage, and I want to make sure it's a maximum length of six, and I'm using a hash of the resource group ID. So it's going to be storage and some random characters after that as an end result. Just yeah, quite nice. So you can uh, create some conventions for all your resources in Azure makes things nice and easy to understand, easy to follow. And um, last up in this little bit is uh, outputs. Like I mentioned, you can actually print values uh, to the console or into other modules when uh, this one has completed being deployed. So, and you can give hard-coded values. You can pass in other variables. 
or you can do the same thing and define it with functions as well. So whatever you need, you can output from the template. This is really nice. Um, so I've already done this one to show you how to create a resource, that storage account, so I can skip that one. <laughs> and one of the input parameters, for instance, here, this one, enable geo replication, it's a Boolean. So you can give it a, a value of true and false. But we can actually use the conditional operator in the code to say, if this is true, do this, otherwise do that. So if I enable geo replication, I want to use a standard GRS type uh, storage account or a premium local redundancy uh, store. So um, yeah, nice and easy. So there's other ways you can do this as well. You can uh, have the comparison operators. Most of, most of the logical operators that you uh, expect to be available are there. So you can actually find the whole table in the, in the documentation. So the next one is modules. This is what makes ARM templates or BICEP templates extremely useful. So we can go and create a uh, BICEP file. And basically, every BICEP file is already a module. We can reuse all the files that we've created before and chain them together. So that storage account that we've created earlier, I can actually reference that using the module keyword, give it a symbolic name, tell it which file we want to use. And this will actually do the IntelliSense for us. If you have them stored in folders, it'll discover that for you and show you the options that are available. And then, for instance, in this case, I'll just, I'm just going to go and delete this line and show you what happens. So it's giving me a red squiggles and saying uh, something's wrong. Uh, it needs to have the params uh, included. So if we go control space, it'll show us what we can do. Parameters are required, press tab, and it already knows that other module that we're referencing, the storage account module, this is the input that it requires. So it, it sort of completes that for you. Much easier to discover rather than you have to go look at the other file and do it all manually. So it can save a whole lot of time. So I'm gonna just replace that with what the original one is. And oh, what I haven't shown you yet is that what we're doing here is string interpolation. So we're give, giving a prefix, uh, using that dollar and squiggle bracket syntax, we can then uh, render the value of another variable into the st string. And if we actually try something different, if we try to do just basic string concatenation, which oops, should work, and normally it does, but you can actually say, um, oh, maybe it doesn't work. Oh, yes, that's right. It doesn't work that way. You have to use concat, and then you do this, and we do this. And then it'll give us a yellow squiggle, that's right. So the, the recommendation is actually to use the string interpolation instead of this function. Yeah, fair enough. So it's very helpful. It tells us what's best practice. And I'll show you later actually how you can configure what you think your best practices are. Cool. So string interpolation, we can do modules. We can also do looping. So um, very simple. We want to say create multiple storage accounts. So we give it a, a value uh, two in this case. And when we deploy it, we're going to go and create a base name, reference that storage account module. Cool. And we're going to loop through this range, this, this count of ours twice. So we get an index variable called i, and we can then reuse that inside of this object. So if you notice, there's a square bracket here and here. So we want to create a, an array uh, of objects. And here is an individual object inside. So it's going to loop around and create us all these storage accounts with whatever logic and properties we put in the middle here. Cool. But we don't have, we're not limited to one way of doing uh, arrays or sorry, uh, loops. We can actually use array elements. So if I've got an input of a number of strings, I can then re-iterate uh, over that using the, the for each sort of syntax that we used to in other um, languages. So for name in storage names, I can then go and get that, that name uh, element and just use it as I like, as normal. Cool. And there's one more. One uh, now there's like a com combination of the two types before. Um, same thing. I've got a, an object here with some input values, and I want to loop across that. Uh, and not only do I want the individual object, but I want to have the index for that object as well. So uh, it, it's very useful. So you know, I find uh, when we're doing VMs and network um, setups, you know, to loop through a lot of these configurations that we pass in, that this is very useful. It makes it quite nice and easy. Uh, always make it sort of part of some of the naming, the zone one, zone two, etc. Now we can do other things. So we can actually tell our bicep template, you know, what sort of scope we're dealing with. So by default, when we try to 
define a resource or uh, use a module. And when we deploy it, it'll go to the current resource group. So when we deploy something to Azure, we always have to specify a resource group name because we're using the deploy group create. Okay. So by default, this is going to go to that same resource group that we specified. But we can actually, with Biosim, it's much easier than in the, the um, JSON to deploy things to other resource groups. So it's, you can change the scope, use the resource group function, and give it the name of that resource group. Pretty cool, much easier. So you can actually deploy things across multiple resource groups from one template, uh, you know, because you might want to keep your databases in one place versus the um, the application because of some RBAC that you want to add to that resource group, you know, all sorts of reasons why you want to do that. And this makes it way easier. Uh, and then we can actually go through and, and do the same thing, but even further than different resource groups, we can go to different um, subscriptions, which is also really cool. So you can actually deploy uh, to your uh, disaster recovery subscription, or even later we can see different tenant. Then uh, you know it's, it's quite nice to do that all from one place. Much, much easier. And uh, so here again, sort of I, another version of what we saw before is that by the uh, at the top of the template, we can completely change the scope to go uh, to subscription level resources uh, instead of uh, resource group level resources. And I can actually go and create resources in this case as well, and more you know, storage accounts, VMs, apps, etc. So we have a lot of power available. So even on the tenant level, so we can go and deploy, uh, I've got a, a management group template here to a particular tenant. Uh, you know, policies and all the other things that we want to have um, in terms of governance for our subscription or our tenant, sorry, we can do that as well. It's all very easy, very nice and simple now. And uh, one sort of interesting thing with sort of changed the way I do my ARM templates now is, um, this comes from the Microsoft Docs actually, to, is to use config maps. So normally we'd pump in a lot of parameters for each environment. So you might have a parameters.dev.json file. So it's called the development environment specific values that we want to use in terms of scale or performance tiers. And then we have another one for testing, production, so forth. But uh, an alternative way of doing that is to actually sort of have those values or those performance figures um, inside of a, a BICEP template for the different environments. So we define the values for a web app, the SKU for a web app in production, and same for staging and same for development. And in our code, what we do is, so we, we as an input parameter, we say which environment we want to work with. And then when we create a resource, uh, when we say looking at the SKU name, we can just index into our config map for that particular environment name and get the uh, web app SKU name, which is cool. And I think there's a typo here, Sky. But anyways, I'm not going to run this one. But you get the idea. So it's, it's quite nice. It's nice and easy to follow. You can see everything. It's quite cool. All right, so that's the basics of ARM templates. There's uh, sort of BICEP templates, all the programming constructs you want. Uh, we can do loops, conditionals, modules, and, and changing the scope is quite cool. All right. So what is Azure BICEP not? You know, what does it not do? <laughs> um, so it, it's not a full con configuration management tool. It's, it's really just responsible for provisioning resources in Azure and then that's it. You know, there's no further configuration after that. So if we spin up a VM, we don't get to then say what software to install and rules and policies to apply to that that VM. You know, that's those. There's other tools available for that. But you know, so things like Chef and Puppet, etc., uh, they are definitely the sort of full fledged configuration management tools. And some of them even do cloud uh, infrastructure provisioning as well. But uh, yeah, in my opinion, it's sort of the bicep is sort of a, a, an ARM template. It's a much nicer tool to use in some of those. But you know, your mileage might vary. Uh, if, if the best tool for the job is usually the one you know the best as well. So um, you know, no problem using those tools at all. So I'm going to compare Bicep with Terraform and Pulumi, the ones that I've used a fair bit in the past. And uh, I sort of summed it all up in, in one big, big table. Now what sets Azure Bicep apart from Terraform and Pulumi is you know, things like state management, where Azure Bicep has access to the live state of your resources in Azure. Whereas uh, Terraform and Pulumi, they actually manage that state outside of Azure by themselves. And there's a whole lot of good reasons for that. You know, um, applying uh, 
when config configuration drift comes into play, someone's been messing around with the resources in in the portal, then we can have this known state that we want things to be in, and we can use that to then correct that drift and bring everything back into um, what we need it to be. Now, Azure Bison can do the same as a declarative uh, template. So this is how things need to be, but uh, it live queries the states rather than managing it outside. And uh, the, uh, the the way that Pulumi does it is very similar to Terraform as well, but the way that they offer it is a little bit different. So by default, Pulumi has a managed service, so they do that for you out of the box. So if you have an account, that state is stored in the Pulumi services for you, whereas with Terraform, it's usually st stored locally but you can store that in cloud or elsewhere with some of their uh, other SaaS options. But you have to pay for that, so it's not just free out of the box. Um, Biset, it's a DSL for itself. Terraform, HCL, which is a HashiCorp configuration language. Again, dedicated uh, way of doing things. It's quite nice, quite simple. It's extremely popular. Uh, also where I work, everyone loves using Terraform. Uh, I'm currently trying to convince everyone to use Biset. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> and uh, then there's Pulumi, but it's different. It's using our common programming languages to, to get the job done. So they support a whole lot of them, C-sharp, F-sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, Go, Python. And you can do some really complicated stuff that you may not actually be able to do easily with Bicep or Terraform. But uh, it just, yeah, uh, uh, even though I've had a great success with it, it is actually a little bit harder to learn and get used to it. There's a few quirks in there especially when it comes to wiring up the outputs to inputs of other resources where I, th I found Pulumi, which is a little bit hard to get, get sorted for me. But um, th these are all th awesome options. They differ a little bit in uh, the way that the projects are managed. So we can have modules in both Azure Bicep and Terraform, but in Pulumi, it's sort of it's a code project. So they're sort of like monolithic applications or deployment applications or, or micro projects. It depends on the size. but um, it's specific to that stack that you're trying to work with. It's a, little, it's a lot harder to reuse the Pulumi stuff uh, compared to what we can with Bicep and Terraform. Uh, Multi-cloud is a big thing for some people, but it doesn't all really matter too much. Now, I think the best tool for the job is the, the cloud provider specific tool to use. Uh, it's just, you know, if you want to use something like Terraform to go multi-cloud, you will actually need to be skilled up in both clouds to know what you, you can do. It's not going to magically solve that problem for you. But uh, some people just like to see that it's a tool that's multi-cloud. Um, now, the support is provided by each of the respecting companies, Microsoft, HashiCorp, Pulumi. Um, but even though uh, with Terraform, you can deploy your resources into Azure, if something goes wrong, you have to go to ha HashiCorp for support. Microsoft might support you directly, um, you know, depending on a bunch of stuff, I guess. But they're all open source, which is great. You can see how the things work under the covers and, and contribute for in different ways. So, yeah. Go, go and uh, have fun with that. That's really cool. Now, the last one, the learning curve uh, measurement is totally subjective. I just made this up for what I feel like. Uh, your, your view on that might be different. So uh, for me, spending a lot of time in ARM with Jason, uh, getting into Bicep was super easy. So you know, there's no learning curve there for me, but uh, Terraform and Pulumi was a little bit more work to get used to. So how do we really use Bicep uh, properly? Um, well, First, you have to start by installing the tools. Uh, you can do that with the CLI or PowerShell, and you can you know, choose your, your flavor there. doesn't matter. Uh, if you want to use it with the, the CLI, it's not already on there, and you just go AZ Bicep install, and when there's an update, you can just run AZ Bicep upgrade. And you can run all this stuff in your DevOps pipeline, so Azure DevOps and, and GitHub uh, Actions or GitHub Workflows, you can use the, to do all your work as well. So I'll just go and show you. Another uh, quick demo, and might have to cut it short because I think we're running low on time. Um, so I have a bunch of stuff in here. One of them is called a full stack web application. And inside of here, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. So I've got a key vault, there's a database, there's a storage account, uh, I've got two may have been by accident, um, and then actual web app itself. So I've spent a bit of time uh, crafting up this application. We've got a whole bunch of inputs. You know, I always want to have project names, environment names, and tags you know, for billing and sort of other discover discoverability purposes, you know, all the allowed inputs. And then I go and define my resources. So I've got log analytics, app insights, 
uh, which then here, oh, this is one I haven't pointed out before is in ARM templates, you have to always have the depends on property to say how the re resources relate to each other so that it can work out the most optimal way uh, and the dependencies uh, of how to deploy your, your templates. So you can't, you know, chicken and egg problem, you know, deploy a database before there's a server, it just won't work. So if you put the dependencies there, it'll deploy the server and then the database. And you know this is what's happening here. So it, just by reusing this object, that resource, that implicitly creates that dependency for us, which is really cool. And uh, so as I go on, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, just defining a web application like normal um, and uh, adding key vault secrets, uh, policies there, oh, what have I got, a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I might even actually adding some R back here so we can use, um, turn on AD authentication between our, my application and Azure Monitor, which is cool. So you can't just uh, spam the telemetry using the instrumentation key. You must actually come from that application. So Microsoft, uh, Azure will make sure the app is authenticated with uh, Azure Monitor, and it, only that app can send stuff to Azure Monitor, which is quite nice. Um, so what I want to do is to actually deploy that app and just let it run while I move on to the next bit. So if I go, da, 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 I'm not on Linux anymore. So I want to go to registries, and then I want to deploy web app. <laughs> this all works still. <laughs> um, so I've created just a PowerShell file, same uh, deal as before, create a resource group, and then go, let me show you, and, and create the deployment. So I've got the, the template file here, just given the resource group a name, uh, and some input parameters, and that should be, Good to go. So it'll take a couple of minutes and uh, we'll come back to this uh, shortly. Now, what I mentioned earlier, DevOps, big part of what we do every day, just to show you that it is uh, totally uh, nice and easy to do in, say, GitHub Actions, uh, GitHub Workflows. Uh, here's one workflow I have set up for this application. We can go and run a, a job here to uh, lint or you know, apply the linting rules to our bicep template file. We just do that simply by running the AZ bicep build uh, command and, and giving them that file. So that will actually run against what configuration we have in our folder to you know, say, hey, are you following best practices or not? You know, like hard-coded strings or passwords and inputs, uh, or if you have a secure input with a default value that might not be allowed, uh, or even outputting a secure value that, you know, that'll fail that sort of best practice step here for you. Then, you know, we can go and validate the template, compare, it, the sort of resource that we're trying to deploy with uh, into a resource group. And uh, the magic is sort of down here. Instead of uh, create, we're using the validate keyword on that same template. So it'll just do like name checks and see if it all complies and it will be uh, good to go. And then after that, we apply another one called what if. So this is where actually we want to see what changes are we going to be applying to our existing resources in Azure if you run this step. And it's sort of like the Terraform uh, um, plan, I think, when it shows you what you're going to do, uh, what's going to change if you run this deployment. So this is the equivalent for uh, Azure ARM. And here's just a step for deploying the application. I'll skip that part. And then the final one here is to deploy the actual infrastructure. So it's just a little bit more complicated than the other ones because I'm actually doing it all by hand. Uh, I'm not reusing some of the available GitHub actions. But then, yeah, just for demonstration purposes that you can actually do it all with the CLI and output some of those uh, values from the template. Um, the magic here is just that, that sort of dash dash query properties.outputs. So I want to get the outputs from the template and write them to GitHub, um, my actions, also my, my job, so I can reuse that later in further down in the workflow, I think, which is uh, down here. You know, we can ignore those problems that we had there. It's a bit hard with this um, oh, here. So here I'm uh, reusing some of the outputs from the template in the step where I'm actually uploading the function app to a storage account with the uh, run from package setting enabled. So yeah, let's have a look and see. Oh, we have an error here deploying our application. Mm -mm -mm. Conflicting error, a vault the same. Oh, somehow I have a key vault with the same name somewhere else. Well, that's okay. We can move on from that. We'll get back to a different example. So, cool. How do you bicep? Uh, yeah, we can definitely 
go and write the templates, you know, create a, a workflow with GitHub Actions. You know, here's some of the basic commands. Uh, sorry, first one is a bicep build, and then we can have AZ deploy group validate to make sure all the naming and resource types are correct, uh, and then run a what if to see. We can actually use the what if step to, to go, hey, uh, there's a manual check or approval check here on the step to see, are we changing the right resources? You know, someone else can uh, check that PR for us and say, uh, oh, you're, you're dropping the database. You know, please explain. You know, we don't want that to happen. Um, and so that's what what if is really good for. And just to see any sort of configuration changes, all that. So you can a uh, bit of a subjective check there to make sure what's going out is actually what you want to happen. Rather than after the fact, go, oh, configuration is missing. Well, we lost the database. Uh, that will definitely make it easier for us to, to spot it. Then uh, also just the final one, just to you know, deploy the actual template uh, AZ deployment group create uh, with all the parameters. Cool. And if we open up uh, our GitHub workflow and check the, the actions tab, this is what we would see. So I created the dependencies there uh, initially to, to build the app and to uh, check for best practices and validate the resources. And after that, run the what if, deploy the application, oh, sorry, deploy the infrastructure first and then the application, all green ticks, exactly what you'll want to see all the time. Cool. Now, the next awesome feature I'm going to talk about is private registries. And what they let us do is to, um, in, our file, in our BICEP files, we can actually reuse other BICEP files because each BICEP file essentially is a module. And then these modules can go into a registry. And what we can do with that is just, if we have a complicated application or a set of resources, um, then we can reuse them much easier. So we can encapsulate it all. And we can actually use tagging uh, to do our versioning, just like uh, Azure Container Registry, you know, used to putting our container images in there. It's just using the, the open container uh, image format. So we can actually store anything in ACR that we want. And in this case, why not store bicep module files in there, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'll jump back to the demos there real quick. And uh, we'll see here, I have a registries file. I did actually go and create a, a container registry already with a bicep file. And I'll quickly show you that, that registry. And just call it very appropriately, bicep flex registry. You go in there, I can go and look at my repositories. And we can see I've already uploaded a whole bunch of modules. So I've got a full stack app, I've got a key vault, um, database storage, another storage, and, and a web app. So for instance, if I open up the, the web app one, I've got different tags for different versions of that web app. Cool. But why is that so useful? Um, I'll go back to the code real quick. And I'll go to this full stack web app. And a whole bunch of inputs at the start, but we can move over and see here, I'm creating an application by reusing the modules that are stored in the container registry using this special notation. So uh, BR, that's sort of the, the schema we're defining for um, the, the um, ACR, what we want to use. We specify the Azure actual repository itself, so bicepflex.azurecr.io, and then the path towards that module that we want with the version tag, which is cool. So uh, in this case, we want to specify version 1.2. But what's really cool as well is that if we take these uh, properties out or if we start from scratch, we actually get IntelliSense as well. Even though it's stored back in a registry uh, in Azure, uh, it actually restores that that module onto my local machine, the local cache, and, and interprets that just as if it was a file on my local machine. And then we get the intelligence, which is so cool. Uh, really nice. So we can have, as a team, for instance, uh, doing a lot of cloud uh, adoption framework work, have all our bicep modules stored in a registry, and then we can pick and choose uh, which modules we need and orchestrate a deployment to a, uh, a subscription or a tenant with that super easy. And I've gone here, I'm just referencing modules for all the different things I want in this application. Cool. Now, uh, with that demo of the one that failed before, pretty much have the same thing, um, but I want to deploy it from the registry. What's different here is nothing. It's exactly the same way to deploy it, it's just that how it references the application, or sorry, references the modules is what's different. So I'll let that run and uh, it's going to do the same thing and we might come back to it a little bit later. 
but that's it. So we can actually reuse all of our modules and pick and choose them, apply our best practices, and, and yeah, it's a whole lot easier. You don't have to have everything on one machine to get the job done. Thanks. Cool. So just an overview, like if you do want to have a, a proper workflow with the registries, it's very similar to how you would do it with containers. But you know, you have uh, the, the dev team do some work, uh, commit the work into the Git repository. We want to run that uh, validation and linting rules that we had uh, seen earlier. But more importantly is also, if I want to store a whole bunch of resources or templates in the registry, I want to make sure that they really, really work. So you want to run a type of smoke test on them. Now, this is where things vary a lot. You know, every service or every resource you're going to have to test differently. You have to come up with a whole bunch of uh, different ways of, of, of implementing these. So if it's a web app, you might want to use something like K6 to do a quick load test or a spoke test on that. Uh, if it's a database or a storage account, uh, if you've enabled uh, or disabled public access, try and access the application and also try and access that storage account and see if it works or not. Uh, and then you know, pass or fail the test. Cool. And then you can go and merge the code and publish it to your Azure Container Registry. Nice and simple, but the really hard bit in here, it will be the smoke testing bit. So um, hopefully now that the, the sort of ACR and the private registries is a, is a, a real thing, we're going to see some cool examples of uh, how we're going to do some real test-driven development with uh, ARM templates or BICEP templates. So definitely looking forward to that. And just a way to, to publish our templates to the ACR, I forgot to show you this in the demo, we just run the BICEP, publish, the module file name, and then the target container registry with a version tag. So you can upload those uh, templates uh, or modules quite easily. Cool. Uh, pros and cons. Let's see. There might be a few. Uh, a pro for me, but there's no state management in BICEP. Um, there's uh, definitely a problem with that, that sort of live state uh, that we get to use. It's not very accurate. So sometimes it gives you a couple of weird results, but I'm sure that's going to get better and better over time. We have a simpler programming syntax compared to the old JSON uh, format. Uh, there's a visualizer in VS Code, but it doesn't really work that well when we try and visualize a, um, for instance, I'm going to try this one here with web app. Click this little icon here, and it should work it out for us. Here we go. And we can see all the resources that we're trying to provision. But if we try and do that with one that is using a whole lot of modules. Let me just clean this up, make some more room. We only see modules. It's, it's not really giving us the full architecture of the application and, and all the relationships, relationships between the resources. Yeah, maybe one day this will work a little bit better where it sort of expands out a bit nicer. But uh, yeah, still, it's okay. Uh, it is a con, but it's not that bad. We can change our scoping so we can have one template that can work at all different levels of Azure. A big thing that's missing, the active choice is not to bring user-defined functions from ARM templates into BICEP. So it's one thing they didn't bring over. But if you listen to the reasoning, it actually makes a lot of sense. You want to not have some really crazy dynamic logic in there. You want things to be very declarative. So that's probably why they decided to, to drop that. Uh, modularity is great. We've got modules. It's easy to reuse code. Uh, makes a whole lot of sense and uh, sort of reduces your workload a lot. Um, there's no resource provider aliases. Oh, yeah, I was going to get to this. Uh, so those long resource provider names, like this one here, yeah, this is still not very pretty. Well, hopefully one day they can make this look a little bit nicer. But uh, yeah, we live with it for now. But I think that's one thing that can definitely be improved. Validation, awesome. So we can make sure whatever we deploy uh, should work pretty much every time, but not always. Uh, parameter files, if you want to have a parameter file that inputs into a BICEP file, it's still a JSON format, which is unfortunate. We have registries, a really cool feature. And uh, hopefully in the next few days, there'll be a public registry provided by Microsoft. But yeah, wait and see what that's going to look like. Trying to get keys and configuration or connection strings from resources in a BICEP file is a little bit ugly. It's not as easy as you'd expect, but uh, well, it's no different to doing it in the ARM template, the JSON templates. But uh, again, I wish it was a little bit nicer. Uh, to, to, to get that done. Now, Microsoft says this is totally supported, day zero support. So anything you can do with the ARM JSON templates, you can do with BICEP. So all the stuff that was announced recently at uh, Ignite, we can actually deploy them with BICEP straight away. We don't have to wait for Terraform or Pulumi or whoever to build in support 
to uh, to provide those resources, which is quite quite nice. Uh, one dirty thing is that we, it's hard to discover modules that are in a, a repository. So um, hopefully, you know, it's early days. They will improve that over time as well. So you have to actually know what's in that container registry to be able to reference it and actually know what it does. There's nothing that lets you dig into it and see what's actually in there yet. Um, and the cool thing is you can actually take your old, old um, JSON templates and convert them into BICEP, which is really nice. There's a cool tool for that. It's just uh, AZ, decompile, give it a file name, and it does a conversion for you, which is really nice. But here's some useful links. I'm going to put all my code, all the slides up on my GitHub uh, repository. Uh, you can sort of capture that link, and I'll put it in the comments as well. Here's a whole bunch of links to Azure Bicep on GitHub, Microsoft Learn, uh, the Architecture Center, which you can go and find some really cool template the architectures to deploy. And some of them are in Bicep already. Um, and there's also the Bicep Playground, which you can sort of use to turn your Bicep templates into ARM or ARM into Bicep, and yeah, it's just a nice little tool to play around with. So just to sum everything up, uh, KISS by design. So Bicep, I think, is still very simple. It's much easier to use than uh, ARM JSON. Um, it definitely has a very nice improvement in the programming syntax, and it saved me a lot of time. You know, I'm a big fan of this one. Less keystrokes is much better. Uh, and regi registries are awesome. We're going to definitely use a lot of this. And uh, you know, there's more coming because we're not even at version one of Bicep yet. And uh, now infrastructure as code is fun again. Yay. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, William. That was excellent. Uh, well done. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, yes, sir. We have a few minutes. So the first question uh, is from Ryan on YouTube, but I'm just going to expand it a bit because it's the host's prerogative. Um, the question was, <laughs> can you use .NET libraries from Bicep? Um, but I guess uh, to expand that a bit, is there a sort of a library story behind Bicep, uh, with Bicep? Oh. Other than the modules you've talked about, is there any you know, libraries to use it or to, you know? That's a great question. I, I think the answer is probably going to be no, because they don't have the, the user-defined functions feature. Yeah. Uh, I think because they want to limit it to be very declarative and not move towards that sort of uh, uh, imperative the programming style model, right? Um, I think the answer is going to be no, but you know, happy to be wrong. Uh, it would be hard for me to see what benefit there is really, but it, it might actually violate that KISS principle that I, I mentioned. Mm. But uh, yeah, we'll wait and see. It could, they could do anything, right? <laughs> but, well, that's right. I mean, and that actually brings me on to the next question, I guess. You said it's, you know, it's not at 1.0 yet, uh, and we're waiting yep. to see in, in some respects. So I guess the, the big question, the $64 million question, would you use it in production? Is it is it ready, or are we still waiting? I'm using it, yes, for sure. Microsoft is supporting go. it already, so since version 0.4, I think. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'm using it already. It, it works great. Uh, okay. No complaints. Uh, look, the, the things that are missing is only the, maybe the programming uh, uh, experience, but in terms of capabilities, all that's working. It's, it's beautiful. Okay, and so then the next sort of the final, I guess, money question. Uh, if I'm uh, I'm at work and I've got a bunch of ARM templates I've written and I've invested lots of hours in, uh, how do I essentially sell this rewrite? Even though I know you said I can decode it, <laughs> how much quicker? Is everything going to get if I use Bicep versus ARM templates going forward? Is it oh, worth right. that conversion? The conversion may not be absolutely necessary because I think the big time saver is from the authoring experience, right? So if you have a bunch of ARM templates that work and they don't need change, then don't, yep. don't bother changing it. I guess if you do need to go back and make some changes, the conversion should be fairly straightforward. You may have to do some cleanup, a couple of things. I mean, it's not always perfect, but... When you have a reason to do it, try it out. I, I, it's, a, it's a good experience, uh, in my opinion, so far. So, yeah, really happy with that. But if you don't need to, don't worry. It's not going to change the speed things get deployed at all. Okay. That's good to know. And I guess because it is ARM under the covers, right? So ARM's not going anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yes. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Uh